Welcome to NTD News Today. I'm Kevin Hogan. Let's take a look at our top stories. The conflict in Ukraine entering a new stage. The battle for the East begins as Kyiv takes another step closer to EU membership. And we hear from U.S. Congressman Pete Sessions. He says lawmakers are working with the Treasury Department on rules about money being passed between the U.S. and Russia. An update at the Pentagon, a top tech official resigns. He said the environment at the Pentagon made it hard to innovate and compared it to defying gravity. He's the third top IT official to resign in the last six months. A U.S. judge in Florida rules that the mask mandate on public transportation is unlawful. On New York City's subway system, riders react to the decision. The conflict in Ukraine has entered a new stage, according to Russia, and Ukraine says the battle for its industrial heartland has begun. And today's Jessica Beatty reports. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said Tuesday that Moscow started a new phase of what it calls its special military operation in Ukraine. I mean, another stage of this operation is beginning, uh, and I'm sure this will be uh, a very important moment of this entire special operation. It comes after Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said Russia launched a new offensive push along most of Ukraine's eastern flank Monday. We can now say that Russian forces have started the Battle of Donbas, for which they have long prepared. Russia has been bulking up its forces in the east of Ukraine, using troops it pulled out of Ukraine's north. Lavrov said the goal is to liberate the self-proclaimed Donetsk and Luhansk republics. <laughs> Meanwhile, Ukraine completed its questionnaire for EU membership. It's a starting point for the European Union to decide whether to let Kyiv join. We understand that our people, deep in the souls and minds, are part of Europe anyway, and for a long time. But nevertheless, each country has to take this path. Unfortunately, we are walking this path in tragic times. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen pledged a speedier-than-usual start to Ukraine's bid to become a member, saying the process would take weeks rather than years. Zelensky's office said it expects to become an EU candidate country in June when the European Council meets. Meanwhile, the White House said Monday it's considering additional sanctions on Russia. You will see us continue to expand our sanctions targets and to continue to take steps to both further tighten our sanctions to, to prevent evasion and, and, and put in place additional sanctions. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki said the early round of sanctions are having an impact on the real sectors of the Russian economy. And she said the White House expects to have more in the coming days. Jessica Beatty, NTD News. The Ukrainian Emergency Service released a video showing demining work being carried out in the Chernihiv region of the country. Pyrotechnic work groups from different areas have come to help Chernihiv technicians remove and neutralize explosive devices. A total of 44 personnel and 17 units of special equipment are involved. Chernihiv is located between the Desna and Dnieper rivers. It straddles one of the main roads that Russian troops invading from Belarus used on February 24th from what the Kremlin hoped would be a lightning strike on the capital, Kiev, which is just 90 miles away. Russia's invasion has upended life for most Ukrainians. One lawyer living in southeast Ukraine now must divide her time between work and some new duties the war has forced on her family. Shana Lushchinska is a lawyer in the local city council in Zaporizhia, southeastern Ukraine. Her husband and son are away in the army defending the country. Well, I stayed. I have no choice. I need to look after the house. I need to wait for my husband to come back. I need everybody to come back. We had a home, but it was more fun to work when we were all together. I'm not complaining. I can cope on my own. Since the war broke out, Lushchinska collects food and medicine for the elderly in the area cares for her 75-year-old mother, in addition to her work in the city council and growing duties on the farm. The farm is equipped with a bomb shelter. Lishchinska says her husband calls her in the middle of the night and asks her to hide. Speaking on the phone from an undisclosed location, 
Her husband says his army unit is well supplied and being buoyed by support from locals. I think the war has united the country so much They've all come together against this disaster, against grief, Lyshchinska's husband tells her. Russia calls its actions a special military operation to demilitarize Ukraine and eradicate what it calls dangerous nationalists, backed by an expansionist NATO military alliance. Carmaker Stellantis says that it is suspending production at its Russian plant. This is due to logistical difficulties and sanctions imposed on Moscow. The world's fourth largest automaker manufactures brands such as Chrysler, Peugeot, Fiat, and Jeep. It co-owns a van-making plant with Mitsubishi in Kaluga, southwest of Moscow. The Japanese firm suspended production at the facility earlier this month. Stellantis had already stopped all exports and imports of vehicles with Russia after the start of the conflict in February. It moved production to Europe and said it was freezing plans for more investments in the country. Van making in Kaluga was in place just for the local market. Stellantis is the latest Western company to quit Russia. Since February, many others have announced temporary shutdowns of factories or said they were leaving the country for good. The U.S. and its allies are looking to adopt a containment strategy in regards to Russia following its invasion. That's according to the Washington Post. Joining us to address how Washington views financial relations with Russia is U.S. Representative Pete Sessions of Texas. He shares with us a viewpoint within Congress on the Ukraine crisis. In the Financial Services Committee, we have taken a large amount of time of engaging the Treasury Department about the rules and regulations of the passing of money between not just America and Russia, and Ukraine, but also about the attributes of an energy policy, about the attributes of foreign policy. And I will tell you, this administration has gotten an earful. I think some could say that they are managing it better today. I think that's truthful. But I think that they missed the boat for the first six weeks, just before and immediately after, about how America should not be in a position that allows the thugs like Russia to be able to do what they've done to Ukraine and to Europe. But on the high side, Europe, meaning uh, NATO countries, have become alive. You see, uh, have a brand new prime minister in Germany who has openly said, we will update the amount of money we are putting into NATO. We will gather ourselves together because they see the threat that Russia poses to Europe. Congressman, Moscow has warned the U.S. of unpredictable consequences if the U.S. keeps sending weapons to Ukraine. Do you think this will act as a deterrent? There, there are a couple ways that you can look at this. Uh, if you want to be afraid of Russia and allow them to use their thuggery, then you will use that as the excuse. The United States of America has always been, over the last 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, someone that did not fall victim to being uh, isolated because we were afraid of someone. It is important that we treat this in the context of not getting into nuclear uh, warheads and, and those kinds of things. But we cannot allow, certainly the United States and Europe cannot allow a country, a sovereign country to be overrun, brutalized, openly killing people and using tactics that are against uh, civilians in the way that they have done. So I will just tell you, no, we've got to be able to stand up. I think we've got to do a better job. I think that our use of, of uh, land-based uh, opportunities, whether they be javelins, long-range rifles, or systems supporting uh, aircraft, the sea incoming aircraft, uh, as well as uh, Stinger missiles, is the effective way to fight. Ukrainian forces have reportedly ambushed a Russian military convoy in Mariupol. This, while a video shows women and children sheltering in the basement of a steel plant in the city. Joining us with some more analysis is Professor Jeffrey Treisman of the University of New Haven. He starts by giving us his perspective on whether President Zelensky's request to Washington to label Russia a state sponsor of terrorism is reasonable. 
I don't think so. Terrorism is a far different definition in international standards and domestically and internationally and how we define terrorism as an attack against a civilian population. I think this is more appropriate labeled as an act of war, uh, violation of sovereignty, attacking a government, uh, its control of its, uh, its territorial integrity as well. Uh, but I see what he's certainly trying to do in, uh, in trying to label this as terrorism is really galvanize the international community more so against Russian aggression. And what strategies have been most effective on both sides here? Well, I think for the Ukrainians, obviously, it's going to be relying on essentially a pseudo guerrilla warfare tactic, hit and run, relying on drones, uh, avoiding those pitch uh, battle fronts um, uh, uh, and trying to maintain territorial positions. Uh, that has been highly successful for the Ukrainians. Uh, on the other hand, I think for Russians, and my research has shown this, is that the more Russia relies on brute force humanitarian violations, the more likely they are to succeed. Uh, but but they have to do it uh, on a whole scale, uh, unrelentless and attacking civilians uh, to dissuade them from supporting the Ukrainian military uh, or taking up arms against the Russians. So that can be effective uh, for Russia, but we haven't seen them do that. We haven't seen them implement that scale of humanitarian atrocities like they did in Chechnya just yet. Um, and the nature of the battlefield, though, is going to change now that the Russian forces have essentially withdrawn from a number of their positions, most notably around the capital, moving and trying to focus now on the east. That's going to change the dynamic of this conflict going forward, whereas Russia is going to now assume essentially a pseudo defensive posture, and it's going to force the Ukrainians more on the offensive. Coming up, three Navy sailors are found dead on the same ship in less than a week. They were all in service aboard the nuclear-powered USS George Washington. That and more here on NTD News. A U.S. judge in Florida called a mask mandate on public transportation unlawful on Monday. Inside New York City's subway system, riders had mixed reactions to the news. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the details. Last week, U.S. health officials extended the mask mandate on airplanes, trains, and in taxis, rideshare vehicles, or transit hubs. For subway rider Merkel, who didn't give a last name, the decision didn't have much of an impact on him. You say I don't got no mask right now, so that's cool with me. Better for me. I didn't even know there was one. One rider, who wished to remain anonymous, said opinions on the mask mandate would likely vary. I think at this point everybody's going to have their own opinion. I know some people wear them because they make them feel safe. I know some people wear them because they're required to. So I think it's going to be a partisan issue for forever just because it's people's bodies and their safety and their mental health and well-being. So I think it's going to vary from person to person. But she said she's going to keep wearing a mask even if it was no longer mandatory. I personally choose to wear one for my own safety and well-being, but for the safety and well-being of those around me. For New York City resident John Ramos, the decision to drop the mask mandate didn't change anything for him. It doesn't matter to me what they do in Florida. I'm still going to be wearing my mask. Ramos also said people have to decide for themselves whether to wear a mask. Well, that's, that's their prerogative. If they don't want to wear it, they, they don't have to wear it, but I'm going to keep wearing it. 18-year-old William Gigerich said he thinks the decision came too early. I just feel like mask mandates are coming down too quickly. People at my school are getting it, like, every day. The CDC first issued a public health order requiring masks in interstate transportation in February 2021. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. The chief tech architect of the Air Force and the Space Force has resigned. His name is Preston Dunlap. He cited bureaucracy at the Pentagon that made it hard but not impossible to innovate. In his resignation letter, he said... I've spent the last three years working to defy gravity and get desperately needed technology into our operators' hands. And by the time the government manages to produce something, it's too often obsolete. No business would ever survive this way, nor should it. The IT officer's resignation comes after two other chief software officers resigned in the last six months. Those two had used their resignations to raise red flags. They warned that bureaucracy was out of control and is stopping talented and dedicated workers from succeeded at the Department of Defense. The chief software officer, who resigned in October, said, This is a massive loss for DOD. The number of top talent leaving the Pentagon is very concerning. 
And referring to the latest resignation, he added, I don't know anyone who is as good as Preston in the entire department. You'll be very tough to replace, particularly since they have yet to replace me. Dunlap said the Pentagon is without a budget, without authority, and without a vision. He described a leaky ceiling, a broken curtain, and a lack of computers and networks. And he said, ironically, as I'm writing this, I received notification that the phone lines are down at the Pentagon IT help desk. Phone lines are down? It's 2022, folks. All the while, he did say there was a strong group of dedicated people that tried to help the Pentagon build a next generation fighting force, but he said they were often blunted by bureaucracy. Dunlap thanked a few individuals for their support, despite the difficulties he faced. On the positive side, Dunlap pointed to many big achievements during his years at the Pentagon. Those include the successful use of 5G, AI to shoot down cruise missiles, and using commercial satellites to get data. But without leaders like Dunlap, key projects to help the U.S. armed forces stay modernized are at risk of stalling, and the Pentagon will need to work quickly to replace these top IT professionals. The Navy says three sailors from the USS George Washington aircraft carrier have been found dead in less than a week. One of them, who has not been identified, was found unresponsive on board the nuclear-powered carrier last Friday. The first sailor, found on April 9th, was identified as retail services specialist third class Mikhail Sharp. Another sailor, who was found on April 10th, was identified as interior communications electrician third class Natasha Huffman. A Navy spokesman says there is no initial indication suggesting there is a correlation between the three cases. The Navy did not give a cause of death for any of the sailors, The Naval Criminal Investigative Service and local authorities are investigating the deaths. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis announced that he will call state lawmakers back for another special session in May. That will be their second. He says it's to bring some sanity and stabilize the property insurance market. In the past several years, property insurance rates have soared in Florida, and some owners have had their policies canceled or have had difficulty finding insurers willing to issue a policy. Florida's News Channel 8 says the station has been contacted by hundreds of viewers. They are concerned about rising insurance premiums and worried they will lose their homes. Four property insurance bills introduced during Florida's regular legislative session all failed. DeSantis says the main focus of the special session will be reform of the property insurance market. But another special session will take place first to handle the redrawing of the state's election maps. DeSantis rejected the first attempt because he says they contain unconstitutional racial gerrymanders. A federal judge rules that a group's challenge to Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene's candidacy in this year's elections can proceed. The lawsuit is using a rarely invoked constitutional clause. The lawsuit claims the Congresswoman engaged in a supposed insurrection against the U.S. government in the January 6, 2021 breach of the U.S. Capitol building. Greens represents Georgia's 4th Congressional District and is an outspoken supporter of former President Donald Trump. The rarely invoked disqualification clause was enacted in the wake of the Civil War to keep former Confederates out of Congress. According to the New York Times, Greens' attorney described the ruling as flawed. He also says Green publicly and vigorously condemned the attack on the Capitol. Green vigorously denies the claims against her and argues that the state law governing election challenges is unconstitutional because it shifts the burden of proof from accuser to accused. The jury in the case against a former Ohio doctor says they cannot reach a verdict. The doctor is accused of causing deaths of, by overprescribing pain medication. William Husel is accused of killing 14 of his terminally ill patients. His defense says he provided care to lessen suffering. The jury told the judge they cannot reach a unanimous verdict and are at an impasse. The judge has instructed them to continue deliberating. Husel was indicted back in June of 2019 and faces 14 counts of first-degree murder. He was initially indicted on 25 counts of murder, but in January, 11 of the 25 counts against him were dismissed. Janssen Pharmaceuticals reached a $99 million settlement. This is for the company's alleged role in West Virginia's opioid crisis. The state's attorney general claimed the pharmaceutical giant and its parent company, Johnson & Johnson, persuaded doctors to prescribe opioids more frequently, saying they were more safe and effective than other drugs. 
Attorneys say this helped spike opioid use for chronic pain issues and eventually led to a rise in fatal overdose. This settlement is subject to approval from the state's political subdivisions, and cities and counties will get a lump sum payment. Johnson & Johnson settled with the state of New York last year for $230 million in a similar situation. The Food and Drug Administration said it is investigating scores of reports from consumers who claimed they got sick after eating General Mills' Lucky Charms cereal. The agency confirmed to several news outlets this week that it is currently reviewing and investigating. It said thousands of people had reported they had symptoms after eating the breakfast cereal. The reports started to come in starting late 2021 to a website called IWasPoisoned.com. Some reports were submitted in April 2022. One person says they experienced stomach pain and diarrhea after one bowl of Lucky Charms. They then said they tried it two more times and experienced the same symptoms. A parent said their daughter came back, came very sick and didn't know why until they saw news reports about Lucky Charms. General Mills said the reports will be investigated, but so far it has not found evidence of problems linked to the cereal. And coming up, Congress wants to make new rules for governing 401k retirement savings plans. Find out how the big changes would impact employers and workers after this break. Secure, the true solution for your digital privacy and security. Secure is a private and secure messaging and email solution hosted in Switzerland using military-grade encryption and Swiss privacy laws, giving you true privacy. Secure is 100% private and does not collect or sell any of your personal data. Secure's Helix technology connects you securely to our Swiss servers without the need of a VPN, guaranteeing privacy and security for all your communications. Secure Messenger doesn't require your phone number or any personal data that hackers target. Chat by Invites allows you to chat privately and securely with anyone outside of your secure network without the need for others to download Secure. Secure Send offers you a private and secure way to email anyone outside of Secure. You won't find this level of privacy or security on any other email or instant messaging application. Visit secure.com. Regain and protect your privacy today. Oh, hey, doesn't it feel like there's communists everywhere? In fact, the Chinese Communist Party has been subverting America from every angle. So whether it's compromising our politicians, controlling Hollywood, manipulating Wall Street, or infiltrating our schools, they have stopped at nothing to take down America. And I believe that in order for us to not become like China, we need citizens who know the truth. So go on over to getepic.com, stay informed with a subscription to the Epic Times, and you will get instant access to this infographic. You're not gonna get it all right. Just make sure you nail the big stuff. Mama! Like making sure your kids are in the right seat for their age and size. Get it right at NHTSA.gov slash the right seat. It may take the post office a little longer to deliver your small packages. Monday, the United States Postal Service announced it is updating its first-class delivery standards, but the service is not getting faster. Instead, the USPS will add one to two days onto the delivery of nearly a third of its first-class small packages. The Postal Service says the additional days will allow them to have more time to deliver long distance and to increase the efficiency of their network. However, a small percentage of customers, about 4%, may see their packages be delivered a day earlier. The Postal Service also plans to change its priority mail delivery, but this time it's dropping the additional day it added back in 2020. The slightly faster service will only be for mail delivered over its ground network. The new changes take effect on May 1st. Congress is taking action to help avoid a potential retirement crisis. A bill expected to reach President Biden's desk later this year could bring about new rules involving 401k programs. Here's a look at how those changes could impact your retirement savings. Here we are, 
Your retirement savings may be about to face a major and inevitable change. Part of this overhaul is to actually force people into saving in their 401k plan. The legislation, Secure Act 2.0, is expected to reach President Joe Biden's desk by the end of the year. If passed and signed, it could require most employer-sponsored retirement plans to enroll eligible workers automatically at a 3% level. That would increase by 1% until you're contributing 10% of your paycheck annually. But workers would have the option to opt out or change their contribution level. Most people do not understand something called the pay yourself first rule. And that means put money in your retirement plan before you start spending money on things like entertainment and travel. The plan would also delay mandatory withdrawals and limit penalties for those who fail to withdraw on time. The proposed act could also make it easier for those with student loans to save and for older workers to make catch-up contributions. It's also a major change for part-time workers who would be able to contribute to 401k plans for the first time. With pension plans nearly extinct and the Social Security Trust Fund facing a 75-year deficit, Experts say 401k plans are more critical than ever. The three-legged stool of retirement has basically turned into a pogo stick, and it's going to be on your back and your responsibility to save money. Renters are losing confidence they will ever own a home. A survey from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York says that the expectation of owning a home at some point in the future dropped to 43% this year. That's the lowest level since the New York Fed began asking the question in 2015. And only about a third of people surveyed with less than a bachelor's degree or who make less than $60,000 expect to own a home. That's down more than 10% from the past two years. 22% of households in the survey report they planned to buy a home in the past, but now view renting as a better financial option. Meanwhile, some people who have hoped to have been priced out at the... Some people who hoped to buy have been priced out of the market, forcing them to rent instead. That, in turn, has driven up rental rates. Indiana Metropolitan Police rescue a mother and her two toddlers from an apartment fire. This happened in the early hours of April 11th. A mother and her two children, aged two and three, were trapped on the second floor. Three officers rushed to the back of the building, and the mother dropped her children down to them. She then jumped down as well. The flames started when a candle was knocked over by a resident, setting a blanket on fire. One person was slightly injured and 20 people have been displaced. Just ahead, Hong Kong's zero COVID policy is raising alarm about the impact it's having on the environment. The strict program is creating loads of plastic waste each day. And Sri Lanka's financial crisis is making life hard for the country's fishermen. It's the country's biggest financial crisis since gaining independence. That and more here on NTD News. Hong Kong's strict quarantine policies are being criticized for damaging the economy and mental health. Environmentalists say they also hurt the environment by generating excess waste. From remote controls wrapped in cellophane to pillows encased in plastic bags, right now new arrivals into Hong Kong are met by single-use plastic everywhere they turn. The city is one of the few places that holds to a zero-COVID policy, which means travellers are required to quarantine in a hotel on arrival. The policy has been criticised not only for the impact on mental health and the economy, but environmentalists say it also leads to excess waste. Skincare entrepreneur Clementine Vaughan flew into Hong Kong this month. All the kind of surfaces that typically you would touch with your hands, like the phones, the, the remote controllers, um, everything's been cellophane wrapped. According to government figures, Hong Kong disposes of more than 2,300 tonnes of plastic waste every day. And with a recycling rate of just 11 per cent, most of it ends up in landfill sites. This disposable face mask is made of plastic. And over time, it will eventually become microplastics and will get into the ocean. Edwin Lau is an environmentalist from the charity The Green Earth. He says Hong Kong's approach to COVID reflects its lack of environmental awareness, arguing that plastics from quarantine hotels should be reused or recycled. People living in the quarantine hotels, they are not confirmed cases. 
they are coming from overseas, so they need to quarantine before they can go back to the uh, community. So what they have used, just like any normal person, they're clean. Hong Kong's strict quarantine policies are intended to halt COVID-19 at the border. A government spokesperson said officials were aware of a surge in disposable waste since COVID began and urged people to adopt a green lifestyle as far as possible. After three weeks at sea, Anton Fernando tallies his sales of tuna and other fish on a dock in Nagumbo. That's a fishing town in Sri Lanka where the country's financial crisis darkens already murky waters. After three grueling weeks out at sea, fishermen in Sri Lanka are counting up their catch on the docks of Nagambo, a tight-knit fishing community on the island country's west coast. But the numbers don't look great to 44-year-old Anton Fernando, and he fears his trade will no longer earn him a living. Sri Lanka is facing its worst financial crisis since its independence in 1948, and soaring prices are piling the pressure on fishermen from the cost of fuel for their boats down to food for their families. For the 21 days that we've been out to sea, we've earned 40,000 rupees. This isn't enough to cover our household expenses. Even before we go home, we know this isn't enough to cover electricity and water bills, tuition fees and food. While fishing is less than 2% of Sri Lanka's economy, its impact is big. It employs a tenth of Sri Lanka's people and helps feed far more. At a nearby beach in Nagambo's C Street neighborhood, 47-year-old fisherman G.K. Chaminda says he's struggling to pay back the loan he took out on his boat three years ago. We are having real difficulties. We eat only one meal per day and groceries are also very difficult to buy. And we also don't have milk powder for the children. We don't have any other basic necessities, so what kind of future can we see? As far as our future is concerned, we feel that we will starve and die. That is the situation. The financial crisis has grounded at least half the area's trawler fleet, according to local officials, who are predicting a life and death situation there over the next three to six months. It's prompted weeks of protests just 25 miles away in the commercial capital of Colombo, where demonstrators have been demanding solutions and the removal of President Gautabaya Rajapaksa. Sri Lanka's financial minister told Reuters this month the government's first priority is to restore essentials such as fuel and that it's seeking some aid from lenders like the International Monetary Fund for the country's economically vulnerable populations. Sri Lanka's fisheries and finance ministries did not immediately respond to requests for comment on specific measures being taken to help the fishing industry. Thousands of troops have been deployed to South Africa's flood-ravaged KwaZulu-Natal province. Residents in the region are still searching for the missing. It's been more than a week since torrential rains hit South Africa's eastern coast, but the search continues for people lost in the floods that followed. Outside of a town in KwaZulu-Natal province, police officers and sniffer dogs scour the river. They are accompanied by local community members the death toll as of Monday, after the rains triggered flooding and mudslides, is over 440. Dozens remain missing. The South African National Defense Force says it was instructed to activate 10,000 troops for tasks including mop-up work and transporting aid. The floods have left thousands homeless, knocked out power and water services, and disrupted operations at Durban, one of Africa's busiest ports. The government has declared a national state of disaster. Still to come, the French public will soon decide whether to elect Emmanuel Macron to another term or to embrace challenger Marine Le Pen. Find out how the candidates differ right here on NTD News. We are being censored. America's news outlets no longer provide the truth. 90% of news outlets in the United States are controlled by six corporations. They're not out to tell you the truth of what's happening. They're out to tell you the picture of the world that they represent. The Epoch Times is independent. We're not controlled by any special interest, and we never will be. This is a battle, a battle between truth and deceit, a battle between forces that would ensnare this country in ignorance and between a media that wants to present you with the truth. 
Subscribe today to our digital edition at theepochtimes.com and join the Americans who are seeking truth and tradition. Read the difference in all your devices. We'd love to have you on board. What they want to do is to be able to negotiate and negotiate a path to unification. The problem is North Korea's strategy, Kim Jong-un's strategy, is based on subversion, coercion, extortion, blackmail diplomacy, and ultimately the use of force to unify the peninsula under its control. Mm -hmm. And that is where the danger lies. At The Nation Speaks, we don't just scratch the surface. We want to go wide and deep. Our viewers come away with a much richer understanding of the issues of the day. We really make a big effort to bring on different voices onto the show. We don't just talk to experts and newsmakers, which of course are extremely important, but we also want to hear from the American people. So the people who are impacted by the policies and issues that we're talking about, because what they have to say is just as important to the national conversation. The French will decide on April 24th whether to re-elect President Emmanuel Macron or blow up decades of consensus in favor of Marine Le Pen. Here's what to expect from them on major issues. Tout est possible. Vive la République! Vive la République! Et vive la France! On April 24th, the French people will decide whether to re-elect President Emmanuel Macron or Marine Le Pen. Here's where the candidates stand on three major issues. The economy, Europe and the Western alliance. First up, the economy. Marine Le Pen advocates for a big spending protectionist government. The candidate wants to implement a buy French policy for public tenders, cut the minimum retirement age to 60 for those who started work before 20 and scrap income tax for those aged under 30. As soon as I started my campaign, I integrated into my presidential platform to give back to the French 150 to 200 euros, on average, per month and per household, because I can well see that they can no longer get through it, including the middle class, who today can no longer survive. On the other side, Macron follows the, quote, neither left nor right motto. The French leader plans to double down on supply-side reforms he has implemented during his first mandate. The main plank of his manifesto is to increase the minimum pension age to 65 from 62. The only step we can take is for people to work longer, but it must be done in an intelligent manner. Although Le Pen has abandoned earlier plans to leave the euro, she has pledged to cut contributions to European Union coffers. She insists French law should prevail over EU rules and says she wants, eventually, to replace the EU with a, quote, Europe of nations. She has yet to spell out what this would look like. Le Pen would also employ thousands more customs agents to check goods entering France, including from other EU countries. Analysts say that would undermine the single market. In contrast, Macron is an ardent Europhile. He would continue to push for what he calls Europe's strategic autonomy in defence, technology, agriculture and energy. Macron has worked to reduce the bloc's dependence on other powers and sought to reorient the EU towards a more protectionist stance. He is likely to push for more regulation of US tech giants and has said he wanted to create a European metaverse to compete with Facebook's. Je veux une France. I want a France which inscribes itself in a strong Europe, which continues to form alliances with great democracies to defend itself. Not a France that exits from Europe with only international populists and xenophobes as its allies. That's not us. And finally, the Western Alliance. Le Pen wants to pull France out of transatlantic military alliance NATO's integrated command. Opponents accuse her of being too close to Moscow. 
She has condemned Russia's invasion of Ukraine, but says Moscow could be an ally again post-war. In an interview, she said she would pursue a foreign policy at equal distance from Washington and Moscow. Don't seek to put me in a box because I don't fit in any mould. I'm a patriot and I do what's necessary for the French people to be prosperous, to be safe, to be happy and confident about the future. Macron has also ruffled NATO's feathers, describing it as, quote, brain dead back in 2019. He has since said the Russian invasion of Ukraine had, quote, jolted it back to life. He wants to make Europeans less dependent on the US military for security and has pushed the EU to focus more on the Indo-Pacific and China's rising influence in the region. Dramatic security video, it captured the moment a commuter faints and falls off a train station platform. They then fall into a gap between moving train cars. All this at an Argentinian railway station. Security camera footage shows a woman stumble around on a platform at the Independencia station near Buenos Aires. She loses her balance, falls towards the moving train, and collapses into the gap between the carriage and the platform. And she miraculously survives, and medical services put her into a wheelchair and take her away. She is taken into an ambulance and then transported to a local hospital and treated for injuries. A later media report calls the woman Candela. She says that she doesn't know how she is alive. She already has been discharged from the hospital. She told a local TV station that she experienced a sudden drop in blood pressure and fainted. The woman says she tried to warn the person in front of her, but doesn't remember anything else. And coming up, researchers celebrate the rise in the seahorse population in Rio de Janeiro. A ban has helped them flourish, and local fishermen have changed how they deal with ones they accidentally catch. All that and more here on NTD News. SpaceX Crew-4 arrived at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Cape Canaveral, Florida. The launch is targeted for 5.26 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, Saturday, April 23rd, from Launch Complex 39A at the center. We've been training uh, for many, many months, and, uh, and we're starting to, we're seeing all those boxes getting checked off, and uh, it, it's very exciting now to, to have this box checked off. Really, really exciting to get to ISS and uh, get down to work with this fantastic crew and the uh, three cosmonauts who will be part of our expedition, uh, who are our um, dear colleagues and friends uh, who are waiting for us uh, up there already. The Crew Dragon spacecraft, dubbed by Crew 4 as Freedom, is scheduled to dock to the space station at 6 a.m. Sunday, April 24th. The flight will take crews from NASA and the European Space Agency to the space station for a science expedition in microgravity. The mission is the fourth crew rotation to fly on a SpaceX Crew Dragon spacecraft and Falcon 9 rocket and the fifth SpaceX flight with NASA astronauts. Researchers in Rio de Janeiro are celebrating a growing seahorse population. This comes after a ban on their capture in local waters. The bay used to be Rio's most dangerous spot for seahorses, but now these extraordinary creatures are making a comeback. This orange seahorse is the most common species found in Rio de Janeiro. We found a pregnant male seahorse, big and beautiful, and in very good health. The next step is to register the depth of the water, its temperature, and the length of the animal. Marine biologists also found a hairy seahorse. It has skin extensions for better camouflage. Seahorse populations in this bay used to be severely depleted. That's because divers would catch them and sell them to aquariums. Seahorse trade did not have specific legislation, so people came, collected them, and sold them to many aquarium shops, whether in Brazil or for export, and there were no rules. But now the number of these remarkable animals has begun to grow. In 2014, a ruling was issued, number 447, from the Environmental Ministry, which banned the collection, handling and storing for seahorses in their natural environment. Since 2014, what we have seen here at Woodka Beach is significant consistent growth in the number of these animals. 
The Seahorse Project is also working to educate fishermen at Copacabana Beach. Their fishing nets often entangle nearby seahorses. Now they are learning how to release these animals without harming them. When we set out our fishing nets, sometimes the seahorses pass by and get stuck. So when we pull in the net, we return them to the water. When they are weakened through our association with the Seahorse Project, we bring them back. We call them and they take them back to the university to treat them and later return them to the sea. The University of Santa Ursula has also set up a special laboratory for these seahorses, providing the genetic base for their reproduction. This way they can still repopulate in case of an accident, like an oil spill at sea. Male seahorses incubate the offspring. He becomes pregnant and we are able to tell him apart because he has this structure in the belly region. This is a pouch. It resembles a kangaroo pouch but is more complex. It looks very much like a female uterus. Seahorses forage for food near the sea floor. They also contribute to the survival of their environment. Feeding on algae near the sea floor helps preserve the underwater vegetation and keep the delicate balance of life in the sea. Sheriff's deputies captured video of a large alligator crawling through a front yard in Florida before making its way into a community lake. The video was taken Sunday morning in Venice, Florida. That's according to a Facebook post from the Sarasota County Sheriff's Office. Deputies estimate the gator was about 10 feet long. The Sheriff's Office notified the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. They also warned local residents to be on alert. Venice is south of Tampa on Florida's Gulf Coast. The Cincinnati Zoo may want to get a couple truckloads of pickles and ice cream. Officials there announced B.B. the hippo is pregnant. The calf is expected to arrive this summer. That, of course, means Fiona, the zoo's international social media star, will be a big sister. Fiona became known across the globe shortly after she was born six weeks early in 2017. She weighed a record low 29 pounds at birth. That's about a quarter the weight of a typical newborn rhino. Even so, Fiona survived and thrived. She's now a healthy 1,300 pounds. Officials at the zoo say they weren't expecting Bibi to get pregnant this soon, mostly because she was on the hippo version of birth control. Scientists from the Center for Conservation and Research of Endangered Wildlife are keeping a close watch on Bibi and have started giving her hormone supplements. And finally, let's look at seven foods that can help lower cholesterol. Here's Gina Marie who brings us Strong Mind and Body. Welcome to Strong Mind and Body, I'm Gina Marie. Did you know that almost half of American adults have high cholesterol? A combination of lifestyle factors and genetics mostly influence it, but what you eat still matters. In fact, when you eat closer to what the dietary guidelines recommend, you could lower your risk of heart disease and cholesterol. So aim to eat more fruits, vegetables, protein, dairy, and whole grains. At the same time, eat fewer, less healthy or empty calorie foods like processed meats, salty snacks like potato chips, sweets, and sweetened beverages. So there are eight foods that have the potential to directly improve your cholesterol. Let's look at a few of them. Number one on the list is Brussels sprouts. A half cup serving of Brussels sprouts contains soluble fiber and research suggests that upping your soluble fiber can lower your LDL cholesterol. That's because it binds to some of the dietary cholesterol in your intestines, preventing your body from absorbing it. Number two on the list, a staple in the cupboard, of course, I'm talking about oatmeal. Like Brussels sprouts, oatmeal also contains soluble fiber. That's one win. But also, in a study of obese adults, those who included two daily servings of oatmeal in their weight loss diet significantly lowered their total and LDL cholesterol. Number three on the list is garlic, a favorite in many kitchens. And according to a meta-analysis published in 2016, taking garlic supplements for two months could improve cholesterol levels. 
Number four on the list, one of my favorite nut snacks, it's almonds. Adults who regularly eat a few ounces of almonds have significantly lower total and LDL cholesterol. That was compared to those who eat fewer almonds. Number five on the list is hot peppers. The compounds that make peppers spicy have been shown to have a positive effect on cholesterol. Number six on the list is seaweed. Eating seaweed may help to improve blood cholesterol levels as shown in animal studies, and that was even when the subjects were fed a high fat and high cholesterol diet. So seaweed may be a keeper. Number seven on the list, one of my favorite fruits, it's grapefruit. A study was published in 2014 in the journal Food and Nutrition Research. According to the study, women who ate grapefruit or drank its juice regularly had lower triglyceride levels and higher LDL cholesterol compared to those who didn't. Another bonus, the grapefruit group also had higher intakes of vitamin C, potassium, magnesium, and fiber. They're wonderful to squeeze because so much juice comes out, so get a couple into your diet a few times a week. So there you have it, that's seven foods that can help to prevent high cholesterol. We have Brussels sprouts, oatmeal, garlic, almond, hot pepper, seaweed, and grapefruit. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to put our email on screen. We'd love to hear from you. Until next time, Kevin Hogan, NTD News, New York City.